this is Chris with P2TK9 here with another dog talk. This evening, coming to you from the boat. Why am I in the boat? Well, getting on spring here, weather's turning nice, and I've got fishing on the brain. So I just thought that I would uh, sit out here in the boat, do a dog talk, have me a little bit of the sadly last of this bottle of Knob Creek 9, which is delicious by the way definitely a go-to the boat's a little bouncy I can see <laughs> I can see the camera moving I don't know how it'll turn out but we're gonna go with it because I'm already up here and I'm comfortable time check all right got it so we'll try to keep this one on track it's not going to be a uh, 20 minute or less ordeal or even try to go for that uh, what we're going to talk about tonight we're going to go practical to tactical and we're going to discuss Eastern Block import dogs. What does it mean? We are going to talk about the definition so we're on the same page. Where they're coming from, why people are doing it, are, are seeing these dogs going to be a trend. I'm going to speak on the first time that I saw one. I'm going to discuss the three that I've had to deal with in chronological order. And then I'm going to leave you as always with some action items and some strategies and the ways that I've learned to cope with these dogs. And uh, hopefully some things you can use if you wind up in the same situation where you have to deal with an Eastern block imported dog. So with that being said, if you like the video, please go ahead and hit the like button. If you think that there's worthy information in here, share it with a friend, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. The information is free, just trying to put stuff out there to help the community. If you like any piece or all of it or part of it, use it as you see fit. Again, hat tip to uh, William Kirk over at the channel Washington Gun Law. Not here to tell you what to think, just here to give you information to think about. So with that being said, we're going to get right on into it. So when we talk about an Eastern Block imported dog, what do we mean by Eastern Block? So geographically in Europe, I'm going to call the Eastern Block imports companies to the east of countries, countries, not companies, countries to the east of Germany, starting there at Poland and working your way down. And some of these, these countries are going to be a mixed bag as far as if they are a sport uh, dominant dog country or if they're going to be what I consider an Eastern Bloc producer. Uh, a lot of these company, companies, why am I doing that? I have no idea. A lot of the, I have, swear, even though that bottle is empty and the remainder is in the glass, I've only had one little bitty taste so far. I'm not saying companies. <laughs> instead of countries because I've already been wading into the Knob Creek before I started this. Not the case. Anyway, some of these countries are still a mixed bag. You're going to see some of these Eastern Bloc operations that I'm going to talk about and, and still some sporting clubs over there. So going back to the beginning, the definition of this, this Eastern Bloc import that I'm speaking about specifically. So the reason we say Eastern Bloc versus Western Bloc countries, not only geographically, so starting with all of your sport uh, dog genres that you know about. Uh, of course, Holland has the KNPV, the Royal Dutch Police Training. We have the Schutzen out of Germany. There's the Belgian ring sport. There's French ring sport. So most of your Western Bloc countries are dominated or have a dominant sporting club that they prefer for their working dog sport over there. And then as you drift into these Eastern Bloc countries, the sporting dog clubs decline. The, the economy, the average income of the people that would participate in, in sport dog clubs goes down and it's just not as prevalent. And again, I'm calling them uh, mixed countries or mixed bag countries because there is some dog sport going on over there and some very good dog sport and there are some good clubs but it's not the mainstream the way it is 
on more of the Western Bloc countries. So with that being said, um, you, you source these dogs from Europe, you get these imports. If you're talking about these Western Bloc dogs, you're going to know what kind of a background they come from. Is it the Schutzen? Is it the KNPV? Uh, the, the IPO, which is for all intents and purposes, just uh, Schutzen with a little bit of international uh, scoring standards and rules. Anyway, all that being said, when you get dogs out of the Western Bloc countries that have come from these sporting clubs or sporting trainers and breeders, you can come into these dogs before they have a sporting title for a few reasons. Sometimes, uh, let me back up just a second a little bit more. A lot of these people, even breeders and trainers of, of some repute and notoriety in these countries, it's not like the U.S. And thank God for all of us who are born and raised and live in the U.S. In 2018, uh, Dutch Moyer and I were doing a train up for a patrol only program for the Saudi Royal Guard in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. We went into Germany. I don't want to screw it up. I think his company is Dog Scout International, Thomas Haas. Great guy, really good, good dude, reputable. If you have an occasion to deal with him or train with him or get information from him, it's certainly worth your time. We spent a week at uh, Thomas's in Germany and while we were there, he was discussing with Dutch about getting a letter written from Dutch's company to show that his kennel was conducting business that had international ties. And why did he need that? Because he needed this documentation to present to the German government because the farm next door to his kennel and his property was up for sale. But even though he had the financial ability, he can't just go and acquire this property and expand his dog operation because Germany controls private property ownership to a great degree, especially in the, the real estate arena. And he had to try to go and get documentation just to expand his operation. So thank you, Lord, for living in the United States of America. And I have been around the world a few times and there's no place like home. So with that being said, how does that relate to our Western breeders and trainers? A lot of these guys that even have a business or are working out of their home, they have a limited amount of space. So when you're talking about the top trainers in sport work in Western countries in Europe, you're going to find that they have limited real estate at their house, at their operation, at their kennel. They want to trained to a high level of notoriety and accomplishment in their country. So when they have this litter, they quickly start to whittle that litter down. They, they get to their top two or three dogs, maybe four at the most. And as the dogs age and training uh, goes forward, they start to decide which one of these dogs they think is their best shot to go to the regionals or the nationals in their representative sport and do the best and get the most notoriety as being a breeder or a trainer. So they're, they're going to start peeling some of these dogs out of the litter because space is limited, their, their time and their man hours are limited. So they're going to start peeling these dogs off and some of them come up for sale and get into the market where they're imported into the U.S. So that's one way we get these dogs. Another way we get them is after they're titled, and these dogs aren't going to be kept on as a, a stud or a dom. And if they, they are, then sometimes they'll go ahead and get that litter and put these dogs up for sale anyway, because again, we're talking about that limited space, man hours and, and room in their kennels. So these are how these sport club dogs make their way into the U.S. market. And it is of great value to the U.S. dog trainer and the U.S. working dog handler and trainer and program because these dogs already have uh, generational knowledge and a ton of man hours put into them when you get your hands on them. So uh, a titled dog can be anywhere from usually around two on the low end uh, up to four, four and a half. Doggone it.
uh, I meant for this video to bring out my certificates for my first police dog, Barry, PH1 and PH2, and I actually have the certificates with his picture on them and the dates uh, of his uh, certification trial. I'll tell you what I'll do. I will uh, take a couple of pictures after the fact and insert them here. So you can see those. And I will also include a picture of some of the scorecards. And when you import these dogs, and I've had the good fortune over the years that I've been a soft MPC trainer to get my hands on a lot of titled dogs. And I like getting the titled dogs, even if they are already three or four years old because they're mature, they've had a ton of exposure. The people that are breeding and, and getting these dogs titled in the Western European countries, they have their pipeline down. So these dogs have a lot of advantages when you bring them in. They've seen a lot. They're, they're already oriented to being dog neutral. They're already oriented to being uh, generally social and having a good temperament in, in public. Um, you just take one sport to the next and you have to know what you're getting. If you're getting a Schutzen dog, you know that he's going to be sleeve only and bark and hold, but you can break the bark and hold and you can introduce the suit and get some of these other items worked out, but they're already certified on tracking and have a, a good foundation even in your basic tracking. I think Schutzen 1 is 100 meters with two turns, if I remember correctly, but they're already a nose down hunter for soft MPC. If because we do have tracking as a component of that program, they've already got tracking in there. You know that that's a check in the block. And if they will go down and certify in Schutzen doing uh, tracking, then you've already got a leg up when you start teaching this dog IED detection and roadway clears. When you're talking about a KNPV dog, KNPV dogs are already introduced to water. They they already know. Uh, about seizing a decoy in the water, apprehending a decoy in the water, swimming, doing a toy retrieve from the water. They already know the suit. Most of them already have some body parts that they're mentally open to, arm, leg, back, frontal bites. So you just learn what the ups and downs, peaks and valleys are of each of these sports. And then you know when you're at the vendor and you're shopping a titled dog or a dog that comes from one of these clubs, what club did it come from? And then you're going to know some of the areas where you've got a head start and some areas where you're going to need to do a little bit of, of retrain or deconflict and you're off to the races. But for my dollar, I love working with an imported titled or uh, advanced club dog because they've already done so much work and, and given you a great head start on, on a good number of things. So I like that. Uh, I have been to Europe to shop for dogs on numerous occasions in person. And the first time I saw what I'm going to term an Eastern Bloc operation was in one of these Eastern Bloc countries. And what I saw was a decent sized kennel for over there that had minimal staffing. They have the dogs, pardon me in the indoor runs and then they have uh, i've seen two different methods uh, in these operations uh, not country specific but there will be the back tie that is kind of a four by four by four or five by five pressure treated post in the ground and it'll have a piece of swivel hardware on the top and the dog will be brought out um, put on a a herringbone chain the kind that you would be familiar with, uh, with a stakeout chain, a big heavy gauge herringbone, put on the swivel hardware on the top of the post, and the post is set in the ground. And so the dog has three or four feet of chain and they can do a 360 around the post. And then there's another type. I see the camera bouncing. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll try to, to, to not be as animated as I normally am. The other one you'd see would be a piece of concrete with an eye bolt or a piece of swivel hardware in the ground so it's at ground level 
And again, three, four feet of chain, they can do a 360. So what do these operations look like? They go into the kennel. Normally this thing is staffed minimally. You might see 20 to 40 dogs in an operation like this that's going to be run and handled and trained by maybe two to four personnel tops. They're going to go in in the morning. Most of the time, they don't even bother putting the dog on a leash because, and I'll get into how they're trained and what this translates into behavior wise, they get the dog by the collar and the dog is already in drive and ready to go so normally the dog is kind of bouncing on two back legs and the the staff is holding the dog by the collar and drive a flat collar and they sort of either run on their back legs or bunny hop along beside the the staff all the way out to the chain where they're going to be put on their back tie uh, for the the day and this, I'll get into all of the things this causes, but this already starts causing problems. So they go out there, they put the dog on the back tie, and then the day begins. The only time that these dogs see people are when the staff is interacting with them. And everything is intensity meant to create drive, to build excitement, to build energy. So every interaction that they have with one of the kennel staff coming up and down the line is a lot of energy uh, coaxing the dog to, to come up with energy and drive. Every interaction is meant to be super exciting and high energy when they come out with a pan of food, when they come out with their tug toys and their bite apparatus, when they come out and teach them to possess a Kong and play tug of war games with them. The, the point being that I need you to take away here and tuck away in the back of your mind as we go along is every interaction with a person is meant to create the maximum amount of energy and drive. Once they hit the end of that back tie, they, they feel that hard stop. It doesn't dissuade them one bit. They go into a circle. They're always out at the end of that pulling, pulling as hard as they can. Everything that they're given toy or bite wise is taken away from them using the strong method out, the hard out. However you want to term that, it's either picking up by the flat collar and restricting air until they spit it, pulling on the collar and on the toy simultaneously and pulling it out of their mouth. The point being here, they are never taught an out. They are never told no. They are never made to behave or show any kind of impulse control. Tuck that one away for discussions as we go along into this. But these dogs are energy, 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 drive, 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 grab it, hold it. If there's two on the ground, grab and hold two. If there's three on the ground, get all three in your mouth and hold them or absolutely drive yourself crazy trying. And that's what the, the day for these dogs look like there casually somewhat carried out to their back tie, put onto a back tie. They're worked up and down the line by the staff with their uh, interactions for training for the day. Once the day is over, the kennels are cleaned and prepped. They grab these dogs, take them off of the chain, hold them by the collar, run them back into the building and, and load the kennel and shut everything up and call it a night. So these dogs, every time they have human interaction, it's, it's very intense and very high energy. So the first time I saw this, I wasn't buying any of those dogs, but I saw one of these operations and I thought, I'm not sure what that would look like to work with one of those dogs, but I have a pretty good idea and it does not excite me. So um, I want to stay kind of on a time hack here. With that being said, I hope that kind of paints the picture for you about what one of these back tie kennel operations looks like. So moving forward chronologically a few years into MPC, there's a, a trainer in the community who has always had outsized influence and a pretty big voice for really no discernible reason. Take a little pause. And he postulated at one point in time, what about the challenges with getting 
a sport trained dog to engage real life bad guys for real that don't have equipment on. And he, he proposed, what if we raised from puppies or got dogs from a program that wasn't necessarily sporting based and the dogs didn't have this equipment drilled into them with such a, a regimented style of training. So with, again, the Schutzen, it's a barrel sleeve only. There, there are no leg bites. There are no back bites, no chest bites. So his idea is, well, instead of a Schutzen dog being so arm oriented, if we were getting a dog that was never taught a barrel sleeve and didn't have these, these kind of mental pictures, would that be a, a better dog for patrol work? And um, his exact verbiage was ghosts in their head. Uh, we, we don't want KNPV dogs that have these ghosts in their head that we have to contend with to make them a, a worthy real life street dog. So at the time, I kind of thought, I'm not sure about what you're proposing here because we're having a ton of success with all of these sport trained dogs. There, there are issues and protocols to run through and try to proof them out and get them ready for real world engagements, but we were getting real world results. There, there absolutely is no denying that. And in the 20 year span of the GWAT, uh, there are tons of, of well-documented bites, um, bunches. We, we did well. And a lot of these dogs pretty much came from that sporting background and it is totally doable. So moving forward again, chronologically, I get into the Department of State program in 2018 following my reference trip with Dutch Moyer to Saudi Arabia, where we spent the week in Germany at Thomas Haas's buying dogs there to, to take into Saudi Arabia. And we started with dogs that were provided by the contract companies that had a piece of the WIPS, the Worldwide Protective Services contract, WIPS and WIPS 2. So the companies that had a piece of that, that massive bid, and because WIPS for the State Department is so huge, no one company could get it. And even if one company did get it, they would end up having uh, the, the prime contractor role and they would sub this thing out six ways from Sunday so rather than doing that, the State Department, which for all the things our government does and as many complaints that I have with the State Department, which are many, that was actually a pretty smart move where they would break up whips and bid pieces of it to multiple companies just to try to not only keep it fair and not have a kajillion dollar award to a single prime that they have to split up anyway, but to go ahead and, and break it up into pieces and bid those pieces. So with that being said, when the uh, company that was awarded one of these pieces had a dog component, then they would source those dogs and do the training and then they would send you to the validation center in Winchester, Virginia, and you would take dogs that are sourced by and trained through these, these separate contract companies you get a job with them, you get paired with a dog, you pass the in-house piece, then you go on and you get validated by the State Department, and then you're off to the races making money. So with that being said, 2018 and 2019 for me was one of these dogs that had been sourced by the State Department, not the State Department, I'm sorry, sourced by the contract company, awarded a piece by the State Department, and then trained in-house, and then you go to Winchester to the, the facility, and you get your certification good for 180 days, and then you go and, and work and do good things. So uh, my first experience was great. A little quick aside here, they will tell you when you went to the State Department, and there's all these German Shepherds and Malinois running around the contract company that I worked for, which I won't drag into specifically, in this video, but all of them thought this, which I thought was hilarious and also showed how little they really knew about the background of the dog world. They would say, oh, we have a single purpose program. None of these dogs are bite dogs. <laughs> Hold the phone for a second. If that dog was imported from Europe, 
that dog was part of a club style sport dog pre-train and they failed at some point during this pipeline from being trained from a small pup up through trying to be certified in a particular sport. Now they may have had some kind of a stumbling block during that process and that's when that dog gets cut out of that person's small kennel and pushed into the market for sale or they may have already been for sale and they offered them up to someone doing testing, assessment, and selection to bring these dogs stateside, and the dog failed somebody's patrol assessment and probably failed more than once. Probably these dogs on an individual basis were presented to buyers two, three, four times and failed multiple different screenings before the people who own these dogs or one of these big focal point collection kennels that had the dog finally said, okay, screw it, we're gonna recoup our money that we can and go ahead and sell this dog as single purpose. So why is that noteworthy? Because dual purpose dogs or patrol trained bite dogs bring more money when you sell them and export them. So if you have a pointy eared dog that came from Western Europe, I promise you that dog has seen bite apparatuses tugs, pillows, sleeves, puppy sleeves, maybe suits, maybe full barrel sleeves, but they have tried to introduce this dog to bite work because bite dogs, bite dogs bring more money, bottom line. And once this dog proves that they can't cut it for some reason, <coughs> it's only at that point that this dog is uh, reduced down to single purpose status. And then the person who owns that dog says, fine, I'm, I'm, I've got a program to run, I, I want to recoup expenses, so I'm going to cash out and take what I can get and go ahead and sell this dog for the lesser single purpose money and get him out of here. Then all of a sudden these dogs wind up in a contract company in a non-bite program for the state department and there have been guys bid in their hotel rooms with these dogs. There have been dogs cock off in social settings, there have been dogs that were extremely gunfire aggressive or gunfire shy or a whole host of reasons that a potential patrol dog would fail someone's patrol screening and assessment, then you see these behaviors manifest once they get overseas for the State Department. But again, these people are so ignorant to the mass overall system, they say, oh no, these are single purpose dogs. Nope, nope, they just failed their way into a single purpose program. Pretty big difference. So, still chronologically here, we're going into 2019. I've got my German Shepherd. We're a great team. I absolutely love him to death. We're doing great. Um, I've mentioned it before in other videos and I'll mention it again here. The detection certification that the State Department puts on in Winchester, Virginia at their facility is soul crushing. Soul crushing. I have seen grown men brought to tears by this thing. It is no damn joke. Uh, with that being said, Tebow and I, we were, we were clicking. And we were going in there getting first day goes on our certifications. I couldn't have been happier but the State Department had already signaled to the contract companies and everyone on WIPs, GFEs are coming. What are GFEs? They were uh, known in the slang as GIFEs, uh, dogs that are government furnished equipment. The State Department, in their grand wisdom, was going to go to Europe, test, uh, assess, and select their own dogs, which were raised as non-bite dogs, and imported into the US, trained by their staff in-house at the facility in Winchester. And instead of training under roof at your contract company, you would go to the facility in Winchester, train with the cadre there at their facility, then do your certification in-house, then walk away from your dog. You would get it at the airport, the at JFK in New York. They would drop your dog off. You would sign a hand receipt, just like you would a weapon. You would sign for the microchip of this GFE dog, and then the two of you would go over, work the schedule set uh, forth to you on your 180-day certification. You'd bring the dog back. The dog belongs to the State Department. It's themselves proper. 
and it does not belong or is provided by the contract company. And this was going to be the new system going forward. So I'm there in 2019, the riots start, we get late into the year, go home for the year, and I come back February 2020, and I have been notified over Christmas. Of course, I knew that the GFE was coming because I was offered the adoption of my German Shepherd Tebow, my contract dog and told that when I came back that I would be going into the GFE system and I would be issued a new dog and that would be that and going forward that's the system. So I show up, we get this massive hot airbag brief from the State Department which was, time check, absolutely laughable we have conducted so much research. This is the best dog program ever. We've gone everywhere. This is the way, the best way, the best dog. And if you don't like it and you don't want to go make the high uh, daily rate that you're making, get up out of your chair and walk out of here and don't come back. Don't tell us you know better. Don't change anything. Don't ask any questions. The answer is no. Do it the exact way we tell you to do it and no other way. And that's the system. So that's what I did. And we went out onto the floor and we were introduced to our dog. There was no picking, there was no preference, there was no what did you like. It was tantamount to pulling a Glock 19 or an M4, the State Department weapons, right off the shelf, plunking one in your hands and saying, here is your equipment, go qualify. So without any real effort to try to match handlers uh, with a dog that, that they were really compatible with, you were issued dogs. And the minute that we went out on the floor and started at day one, I knew the road was going to be rough because immediately I could tell where they got these dogs, that these were Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Bloc country back tie dogs, and shit was going to be rough. And it was. Dogs were only put on a flat collar, no chokes, no pinch, nothing that takes up slack. It was a flat leather collar only. You were not allowed to even take the leash and lift up in the leather collar and pick their toes up off the ground. These dogs were had no out. You were issued from day one a toy pouch with two Kongs, and if you had to stand there for five minutes holding that other Kong out, trying to tease it, drop it on the floor, pick it up, shake it, be animated, be not animated, stand still. The only way that you were allowed to get the toy away from the dog and continue your certification was with another toy. And if your dog was lockjawed, as so many of them were, your dog was then given, you as the handler for your dog, was you were given a second pouch which held a bunch of cut up hot dogs in it that they provided for you so that because you couldn't tease out your, your first toy with the second toy, you would stand there and chum your, your dog with cut up weenies and get the toy back. Well, for those of you who are in the know about D sort or Nort that the State Department uses, the two 20 cinder block circles of death that you have to do uh, as phase one in your certification by the time that this dog has had eight or ten pieces of cut up hot dog to get the Kong back, you get, I felt, because my dog, at least I could get mine back and, and we'll continue on with what that road looked like for me. But I felt bad for some people who had it worse than I did. They're feeding their, their dog the food and by the eighth, tenth toy exchange for food, dog saying, whoa, whoa. Man, that is delicious. I am so full, I could not take another bite. And that Kong is all the way back there in the molars, just like they were taught to hold it at their back tie kennel in Eastern Bloc countries in Europe. Oh, no, no, I'm good. I don't want that piece of hot dog. Now what are you going to do? And the, the staring contest was on. Uh, one of these guys in particular, he was a handler uh for the am canine uh program that was there before they got closed out 
and he was a, a former Marine and I liked him. He was a damn solid handler and he had a, a pouch with two Kongs and a bag of hot dogs and man, this guy, his, his whole week was uphill. So anyway, the dog that I was paired with, Nico, I could mess around and tease around and eventually get it back. And as those of you, again, in the know are aware, every event except the circles of death, D sort, Nort, are timed. Parcels, the cardboard boxes are timed. Luggage, timed. Cars, timed. Rooms, timed. But they gave you no allowance, nor did they change the time hacks for this new system of dog where some people are losing 15, 20, 30 seconds, 45 seconds per rep trying to get the toy back from their dog. And oh, by the way, the State Department doesn't allow any praise offs. It is a straight up one for one system each time, every time, all the time. Every time your dog finds uh, an odor and finals, unless you're calling bullshit and saying that it's a false, you got to pay that dog your primary re reward, that Kong. So there, there was no extra time given, even in the face of what you had to deal with. So fast forward that, I get a first round pass. What can I say? Um, take my dog, get in country, and we had a full week of train up. Well, also in the State Department's grand wisdom, they have this massive, multi-million dollar, beautiful facility that is squeaky clean, bleached to the hilt. If, if dogs during certification slobber on the floor, they come out like an NBA basketball game, stop everything. They will stop the clock for that. Come out with towels, <laughs> some bleach spray, a squeegee, return this floor to pristine condition before you continue. These dogs are, are trained and given their idea of working in an absolutely as close as you can get to a sterile environment because the State Department says in their wisdom that the dogs, in order to be the best bomb dogs ever, can only be trained in an environment where there is only like items that are blank present and bomb odor, and it's got to be as clean as possible. We get in country with these dogs, and holy cow, imagine being a bubble boy stuck in your room, Jake Gyllenhaal style, and then you get out in the world for the first time, and everything is new. We go outside the gates to check the delivery trucks coming in. There's an old shoe that it looks like someone's urinated in. The dog won't leave it. Oh, there's a pile of crap from a street dog. Dog won't leave it. Oh, look at this piss stain palm tree that it's as likely that those piss stains are from a dog as it is some Iraqi Jundi who's standing outside the gate. Either one's possible, probably a combination of both. Food trash, water bottles, stuff everywhere. These dogs no more search these trucks than I was down there sniffing that truck because they had just been pulled out of this fish tank they were living in and put into the real world and their mind was blown. So State Department, the, um, oh, what do they, what do they call them? My mind just blanked out on the position. Um, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> I'll think about it right here in a second. It'll shake loose. They have a position that watches everything to do with the contract and the performance of anyone who's on contract and make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to do. We elevated concerns. Concerns were immediately dismissed. Oh, that's fine. Everything's fine. It's going to be fine. Well, it wasn't fine. These dogs had no impulse control. They couldn't walk on a leash. Again, remember, they had been back tied for their entire life. What happens when you feel the leash pressure and hit the end of the collar and there's nowhere to go? You make a circle. So when they hit the end of your leash and you're not allowed to do a leash correction or pop them and they're pulling as hard as they can, they look like a, a sea turtle going up the beach to go and lay eggs. They're, they're nearly splayed out on their bellies, dragging themselves along the pavement or the dirt, wherever you're at. And once they hit the end of that and there's no more progress, they immediately make a circle, usually a right hand circle. And now you're hula hooping with this dog in drive. And 
They don't know sit. They don't know down. They don't know stay. You're not allowed to use any physical corrections. You're only allowed to try to use your toy to convince them to do something that looks like obedience. And because these dogs have no impulse control whatsoever because of their initial training and kennel experience, then with some of these dogs, you can't get a toy anywhere near their face. Uh, I was bitten trying to do toy exchanges with my dog on several occasions. You're not allowed to tell the State Department that your dog bit you do doing a, a toy exchange. Uh, more people started having problems other than just me. Uh, there was a guy there who was a KM for a while and then stepped down as KM and went back on a dog as a handler. And the set of stairs that come out of the trailers that we lived in, he's going out the door and trying to close the door behind him to his room. He's got on full kit, his sustainment pack, and his rifle. The dog has no impulse control, no correction collar. You're not allowed to correct them. Dog launches from the top step of, uh, of the porch, yanks the handler off balance, down he goes. And I can't remember if he broke his wrist or his ankle. I think it was his wrist. But immediately, because the dog has no impulse control and you're not allowed to do any meaningful obedience, yanks him down and he's injured and, and sent back to the rear. So it was a real shit show. And that was my first taste of one of these dogs. Going chronologically, dog number two. I'm away from the State Department program. I'm back in soft MPC. And now we become saddled to a vendor that we are contractually obligated to go to who has now decided we're going to buy the cheapest dogs possible and pipeline them into this MPC program. So we get there and I start looking at these dogs and some of them are 10 months old. Some of them are 11 months old and I've spoken to it in previous videos. I hate a dog that young and that immature, but here they are. Why do we have these dogs that are this young? Well, this is the vendor we're working with now. Gee, I wonder why. Because when you buy a title dog or a dog that's been in a club, they have more man hours put in them. And I'm, I'm going to say that these dogs, the price that they can be bought at in Europe and imported and even acquired from, from a stateside vendor, for the amount of man hours put into these dogs and the generational and institutional knowledge by these breeders and trainers that go into a dog that's two years old when you get it, when it's imported from Europe, for the price you're paying, you're really getting a big value for your dollar. Um, the reason that these back tie dogs are cheap are because they don't have those kind of man hours in them. It's not a small home kennel where somebody's doing a, a litter of four or five and they're putting a lot of time and effort into them and trying to identify the best dogs. Again, I go back to my description earlier, maybe 20 to 40 dogs, maybe two to four kennel staff, and they're doing all of it. And the second that these dogs will pass someone's assessment and selection screening, they are for sale. So we are seeing dogs that are coming in to this program being offered for assessment and selection 10 months old. Well, go ahead and let's do reverse planning on what we know. The dog is already at the vendor. <coughs> he's 10, 11 months old, which means hopefully he's been at the vendor three or four weeks getting odor imprintation and tracking because they do not do tracking at back tie kennel operations. Hopefully because they're selling the MPC, which has a tracking component. Hopefully they're there for four to six weeks at a minimum getting some training before they're presented for purchase for a class slot. Then that means let's go ahead and reverse that back two more weeks for the medical screening and export from Europe, getting them over here on freight. Then let's go ahead and back up another week or two to the vendor actually being over there in person doing their uh, screening process and picking this dog. So if I show up on selection day and the dog is 11 or 12 months old, that means that this vendor probably looked at this dog when it was eight, nine months old, 10 months old. 
Because again, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that the vendors had this dog in country for four to six weeks at a minimum to do some pre-train and get a little acclimation time before they're showing uh, them to our program for purchase. But if the alternative is, no, the dog's only been in country a month, then that means you still looked at a dog that was 11 or 10 months old and you've only had him at your, your kennel stateside for about a month at the most which again is also a wrong answer amongst all the other wrong answers that I just highlighted. So with that being said, I get my first one. <clears throat> now I'm going to hearken back to the comment proposed by another trainer in the community of, hey, we need these dogs that don't have a, these ghosts in their head. So I get our first dog. He's... 11 or 12 months old, maybe 14 months old. He was one of the quasi older dogs presented. I think he was 14 months old. I want to be fair and be accurate. Let's go ahead and err on the high side and say he was 14 months old when I looked at him. Um, for those familiar with the MPC program, you go to the vendor, there's a picking order that rotates between those people who are represented in this program and it's NFL draft style. You're, you're first and then you fall to the bottom and then you work backwards back up through the order to a first again. So the dog that I picked was definitely on my short list. I think I had third pick. I picked him and uh, man, when we got him, did not know sit, did not know down, did not know stay, did not have an out had never been told no in his entire life, which means no impulse control, had never walked any appreciable distance on a leash, which means he does the uh, once around the world every time he hits the end of the leash. I will say that the person who proposed will this dog bite more readily without equipment, at least that one single component of what he proposed actually is true. However, when you look at the baggage associated with everything else about an Eastern Block back tie dog, in this one person's opinion, it is not worth it. Uh, sure, your, your training trajectory and arc from getting this dog through advanced training into live biting someone is much shorter. With that being said, there is zero impulse control. And let me talk about impulse control is not a new concept within the dog training community. Pardon me. It's well known in every level of dog training, pet training, pet ownership, um, Service dogs, your service dog can, cannot be overreactive to anything or have poor impulse control when you're around moving traffic, other animals, large crowds. So impulse control is not a new concept and it's well known, but I want to give it a little bit more of a definition. How about guardrails? Impulse control can also be viewed absolutely as guardrails. And so let me tell you, these dogs have no guardrails. And when they hit the end of a leash, again, they were raised on a back tie. When you hit the end, they're probably out at the end of that line being teased with a tug toy, a Kong, bite pillow, bite equipment, or a pan of food. And when they hit the end of the line, they have been trained for that drive to come up and increase. There is no drive capping. There are no guardrails. And because our title dogs from sport programs have been trained that a leash correction means tone it down and bring yourself under control, that this is a type of drive capping or correction meant for you to realize I'm, I'm giving you information that I want you to reduce or stop what you're doing at the moment. Go ahead, this very first dog that was absolutely bite trained. And oh, by the way, I resigned from the State Department in 2020 because of um, poor handling of COVID and no plan to get us home. So after six months of being stuck over there, I said, put me on a plane. Here's my dog and all my equipment. Um, I'll, I'll go do something else. 
And I had been reporting times of frustration where my dog just got annoyed with with working and screening the the numbers of cars we were doing and would start turning back into me and aggressing me and had bit me just for me trying to scan that dog onto a vehicle that it did not spec, suspect was loaded. Anytime it knew that the, the vehicle was loaded or suspected it, dog searched great. The minute that we were just doing massive numbers of cars and it got bored, it immediately would turn into me and start aggressing me and no one wanted to hear it or even acknowledge that it was happening. And then I left country and I'm getting word from uh, some comrades in the, in the rear there that were still uh, on contract that, yeah, my, my dog and several others were biting people in the kennel and the kennel attendants because they have no guardrails and they're bored and they've never been told no and you're not allowed to correct them. So sorry that I jumped rails and went back into the past. But now we're back with first MPC Eastern Block Dog. And go ahead. You, you pop the leash back on this guy first thing and he's brand new. He's coming up the leash at you because popping him, hitting the end of that line means turn the drive and the energy up. And because he had no guardrails because of a, a lack of regimented equipment training prior to getting him, he had no problem coming up and grabbing your shirt or putting his mouth on the back of, of your arm. Um, I never got bit severely by this dog, but I saw immediately what was going on, realized that this was an Eastern Block import dog, and even though I could correct him and, and bring him in line, I was going to have to view it differently than any traditional sport club trained dog or dog that had been in in a sporting pipeline or had that kind of foundation because everything that you would use in that that whole arena of the the uh working sport dog did not apply to these back tie dogs so uh kind of had to retool and view things differently I had the experience with the State Department GFE program to kind of, of guide me on that. And I thought, okay, I'm going to have to rethink everything I'm doing it and the way I'm going about it. Good news for Eastern Block Dog number one. Bad news um, for Eastern Block Dog number two, which I'll get in again in chronological order. So dog number one absolute chow hound loves treats um, i've been in dog training and and been a working dog handler and trainer for 25 years now and i didn't always use the clicker the clicker wasn't always in fashion at one point in time it was viewed as as gimmick training down at the pet smart but i met a guy along the way who really showed me the value of the the clicker and how quickly you can move with it on a good number of things and I uh, found a, a really, really good guy with it, uh, George Hickox. And man, you can just accomplish a lot with them in a short amount of time. And it's a great tool for trainers and handlers who, who aren't great at voice modulation and having good happy voice and good praise tones and people who have bad timing. So you hit that clicker. The way I, I explain it to guys is just like the shutter on a camera. So as you see the behavior develop, you hit that, that shutter, you take a picture and you're, you're making that snap sound, letting the dog know, hey, that's the picture that I want. And each time you take that picture, you want that picture to look a little bit better than the last one you took. So if I'm trying to teach the, the down, for example, if I can get the elbows to break and bend at all, I'm going to take a picture of that, snap it and mark it. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> And the next time I try to get that behavior, I need a little more dip in the elbow than the last picture I took. And when I get a little more, bam, I'm going to get it until that elbow, the bone is touching the surface that the dog is laying on. If it's a place table, uh, a board, the ground, the grass, whatever, I want that elbow on the ground. And that will be the final picture that we're taking of that. We're going to continue to click and mark and reward that, but that is the picture. Nothing short. Once I start clicking that dog for elbows to the surface, 
then that is it. The standard has been set and I will not click or pay or accept anything that is less than that because now we'll start going uh, the other way and we'll get into extinction training. So with that being said, dog number one, chow hound, lured well. Uh, even though his impulse control was lacking, to say the least, his guardrails were not existent. He wasn't too rough on my hands at first. And without popping with the leash and using back pressure to bring drive up, I corrected him from the front. I would just take the heel of my hand and if he would start getting too aggressive with my, my reward hand, I would just take the heel of my other hand and do something I absolutely was not allowed to do at the State Department. And I would just meet of the, meet of the blade hand, karate chop him on the bridge of the nose and start teaching him fooey. And because this wasn't a, a input from the backside from the, the collar or the leash giving him back pressure, this was a way that I could put pressure from the front uh, in a setting where I could start to communicate with the dog that that drive, that level of drive was unacceptable and he had to tone down the behavior and then the hand would open and the reward would be available to him, the, the little liver treats. And that progressed well. So with a few little nicks and, and a little uh, over enthusiasm for the treat for a few times, I was able to rein that in and man, in short order, got that dog on place, on stay command, on here, on sit, on down, and got all of his, his major food groups of general obedience clicking in just a few days. Um, I think I did two average 10, 15 minute sessions, put him on two a days, and I had this dog basically done in three days and on the second session of the third day we were on the o course and he was eating it up uh staircases steep ladders a frames once he understood what that clicker meant and that my hand had food in it and if i was marking things to pay that payment was forthcoming and immediately we stretched that out from uh, a one-to-one -one two clicks, three clicks, four clicks. We were stacking behaviors and, and he excelled very, very quickly. So even though he was a challenge up front and we had to view things differently, the KM who I still have now was present for that dog. And he started out a year ago. I hate this dog. I hate this, this vendor. I hate what they're bringing us. And I said, look, I'm not enthusiastic about it, but this dog's going to make, I can tell it, but it's going to be a process. We are a year into that process with dog number one. He's, he's turned out well. He's doing good. But even though I'm going to say that he's a great dog, we collectively and me specifically have put a year of intensive work into this dog to get him to the level that he's at now, to get him matured a little bit. Part of, of him being better now is being a year older just in and of itself. If he's getting any kind of good input and training along that way, a year is going to, to make a huge difference. Holy crap, it's an hour. Sorry. So with that being said, this, this year has really done a lot. But you're going to say, well, Chris, why are you telling me that this Eastern Block dog panned out and that it's good? Because the first part was really bad. And let me go back and juxtapose this against the, the period that I refer to often as the gut of the GWAT, where we were getting title dogs or almost title dogs. And I would get that dog out of a basic class, do a four week advanced training and maybe one or two weeks of sustainment training. And we were taking these dogs from imported from Europe to in the GWAT finding bombs and biting bad guys and doing damn good things in a 90 day, 100 day, 120 day arc. So in three to four months, we were out on combat deployments doing big things, doing successful things with these dogs. Um, and that's not possible right now. 
So you're talking about my level of satisfaction and that of the KM that I'm working with right now is finally saying, yeah, yeah, dog number one is a damn good dog and we, we are really high on him now. It took a year. It took a year of work on our end to even get there. So why, why am I complaining about a year? Am I lazy? No. Am, am I upset with my job? Absolutely not. What I'm saying is if this was the GWAT and we were really in a bind to get guys Oconus and get them to work and be effective at what they're doing, I don't have a year. I don't have a year to support a full-on war effort if that's what we needed, which is what we were doing from when the program started in 2007 all the way through 2018. Uh, before things really started to to taper off uh, dog wise, um, I'm I'm here to tell you, I ran nothing but advanced courses for calendar year 2008, and we were taking seven, eight, nine, ten dog teams at a time, and they would come out of the basic course, uh, hit me and Roy up at Fort Bragg and do an advanced train up, and they were deploying within three to four weeks after they were done with us so there there was uh there was no time for screwing around and could we do that right now with these eastern block back tie dogs hell no uh we would have so many problems uh probably handlers getting bit inadvertently and not because they're bad dogs with bad dispositions these dogs just have no guardrails and no impulse control so it it would be impossible to sustain the op tempo under this system that we were doing in the gut of the of the GWAT. So now let's move ahead chronologically to dog number two that I'm working on now. This is the dog that I opened this video with showing you now I've got him e-collar conditioned. He knows sit, down, stay, and hear and place. All useful behaviors. He's doing them well. I don't have to touch him up too bad on the e-collar. At first, I was concerned when I started with the e-collar because he was just taking it on the chin with known behaviors and me following good protocol using known behaviors that are marked and paid that he already has 90% accuracy with without the e-collar or a, a leash uh, control of any kind. And then introducing the e-collar to that equation and showing him the path out of the stem, I was still concerned because this dog would still rebel against the command and was taking high levels of stem right on the chin. And I thought, holy crap, this is going to be bad. But a day into it, I don't want to get too ahead of the, the arc of the story, but things are better now. Uh, on a dog truck, for those of you who are familiar, he's back into realistic numbers. We're down there and 20 land, uh, which if you're in 20 land and you put it on your, your hand, um, you can barely feel it. It's, it's not even as bad as getting a zap of static electricity touching a light switch. So um, most of his stuff, he'll show compliance on 15 to 18. If he starts getting really edgy and, and juiced and drivey, I can usually snap him back out of it at a 25, 28, and then I can modulate right back down to about 18 so that that's under control now thank goodness but when i started let's talk about dog number two not a chow hound not a uh, dog that wanted the food he was rough on the hand i would open the hand let him have the food he would take it and then roll it around in his mouth and spit it out on the ground hey chris oh, did you try everything okay everything no but I didn't feed him and I tried his regular kibble. He eats, if you put kibble in a pan, our normal food, this dog, you can hear his teeth smashing the bottom of the pan as he devours his pan of food. He is, he is an aggressive, voracious eater. And even on mornings where I did not feed him and I put his food into the reward pouch and was trying to click and pay his normal food from hand, because again, I told you so. Remember the start of this story, how every interaction with a human, and I'm sorry, I can't help it, I can't help it, I can't help it. 
I have to jump rails again and go back to 2020 with my GFE Nico. I couldn't even pet this stupid ass dog. This tiny little Malinois, 14 months old. I finally got him after several weeks where when I was in the room having a cup of coffee and getting ready to get going on my day. I could let him out of the kennel after we'd already been out for a break and let him pee and poop and then brought him back in to eat and go out again. I could come back in and sit down and make a cup of coffee and leave him out in the room without him going buck wild. And that, like I said, took several weeks. Then it got to the point where I'd be sitting there looking at the computer, drinking a little bit of coffee, and he'd come up and start to put his, his nose and muzzle on my arm. And I thought, okay, maybe we're turning the corner a little bit and, and we're going to be cooler. So I would reach over and without any fanfare, I didn't even do or say anything. I'm just drinking coffee and I'd reach over and start to pet him. The minute that there was human interaction, because his entire life heretofore, anytime a human interacted with him, he goes through the roof with driving energy. So the minute that I would reach over and just gently try to control the energy and pet this dog and, and socially interact with him, he immediately would start doing cartwheels around the room and lose his mind because a human is interacting with him. So I had to flash back and, and fill in that little piece of information, that tidbit. Because these dogs are raised on a back tie and the only time that a person interacts with them, it's meant to elicit a crazy amount of, of energy and drive. I couldn't even pet this stupid dog, which drove me nuts. And he would go so batshit crazy in the room, I'd have to put him back in the air crate because he just couldn't handle the freedom. He was, he was already going crazy. So anyway, back to the present. Now that kind of fills you in on where I'm at with dog number two. Even though he ate very aggressively and would eat quickly and finish the pan because he, he's not food aggressive per se, so he's not, when I would come in in the morning after the basic class, when we got him back to home station, I'd try to go in there with that pan of food, no impulse control, no guardrails. He would just basically knock it all out of your hand, being aggressive to the pan, not growling, just diving in there. Om, nom, 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 no guardrails, no impulse control. So <coughs> I thought, okay. I'll try to use the food because he eats the food. He devours it. This shouldn't be a problem. Put it in the bag. Go try to offer it to him. Getting on the, the place table. Would not take it. Would force his way into my hand. Would smell it. Would grab a piece. Roll it around his mouth. And then spit it out on the ground. Weird. All right. Let's go to the, the liver treat. Liver treat never fails. Wrong. Same reaction super hyper, high energy, would force his way into my hand and would get a hold of the treat, roll it around his mouth, out on the ground. I have a lot of luck with uh, pepperonis. Went to the refrigerator, grabbed a few pepperonis, broke them into my little training pieces, about the, the half the size of my pinky joint, start trying to lure him onto the place table. He would sniff it, didn't want to eat it. Holy crap, what am I going to do? So additionally, because the dog uh, has been raised on a back tie, I couldn't work him on the leash at first because it created too much energy and too much drive. And just like we learned with our dog number one, hitting the end of that line pretty much got a high energy, if not aggressive response out of this dog. So I had to go into a small room in our building that had nothing in there. It's actually the feed room. So there's a stainless steel sink, an ice machine, and a metal cabinet that's closed. So there's nothing else in there, and I put a place table in the corner so that I could use physical barriers to try to shape the behavior in this very dry, sterile, mundane room that had almost nothing to look at or interesting in it and not enough square footage for them to, uh, to run around and explore and find interesting just to get him to interact with me for the place table. And I cannot lure him with a toy because again, why? Yes, you're correct. No impulse control, no guardrails. The minute that this dog sees a toy, again, he thinks he's on a back tie. 
and that he's just going to hit the end of the line and one of two things will happen, which have always happened in his world. The toy is close enough for me to grab and I will possess it like my life depends on it. Or it's going to be out there at the end just out of my reach and I'm going to pull and tug and show all the energy and aggression in the world that I can until the trainer allows me to have it and then I'm going to possess it like my life depends on it. So I can't lure him onto the table because the minute you pull it out, no guardrails, no impulse control, he's coming for that toy. So I had to start with a clicker and two toys, <clears throat> one toy out, throw it onto the table, let him jump onto the table, possess that toy, click and mark the behavior of jumping onto the table, and immediately present toy number two and pay him for the act of getting on the table with that mark and pay. And this went on without a leash for three days before he understood jumping on the table and hitting the clicker before I could get it down to, I didn't have to have a toy on the table. I could just present the table. And again, I can't work on leash, so I can't guide him onto the table. I can only present it with an open hand. He would jump up there, I'd hit the clicker, and then pay him for jumping on the table. That was step one, three days. Step two, how do we try to get him to let go of a toy? So now I can present the table, he jumps onto the table, again we're still in this tiny room, click the behavior, pay the behavior. Now I'm trying to get him to stay on the table because even though getting on the table itself is not a punishment and we've taught it to be a thing that he wants to do, as you should, he wants to get onto the table, but then once I paid him, he wants down. Well, because I know he wants down, now I need a new incentive structure in order to start an out. So I get him on the table and I make him stay on the table until he lets the toy go and I mark and pay with a second toy when he lets the first toy go on the table. When he's standing on the table with a toy and lets that one go, he's allowed to jump down off the table and get a new toy. So that's how that went for the next three days, so that's six days to get him on a table and then to get him to let one toy go and not even disregard or have impulse control for the toy that's out. I still have to make it a, a foot race to go get the other one back because the minute that I put the leash on him just to be able to control his range of motion, not even give him input, now he understands, oh, now I'm on a back tie again and I don't trust my range of motion, so I'm no longer going to cooperate. So just getting him to do the two things that we were doing after six days of work on a leash took two more days. So now we have eight days of effort just to play one game of jump on the table, pay on the table, stay on the table until you let go to be allowed to jump off the table and get paid for letting go and get down off the table. Took eight days to do that on leash in a tiny room. That right there alone is enough to take another drink. So now we have that established. So now I'm clicking, marking and paying for getting onto the place table. Time for the next behavior, which is sit. So now we get him onto the table and I don't give him any new information. I just limit his ability to leave the table with the leash, which we've already established that I got him to out and get marked and paid for a new behavior by letting go of the toy on the table. So now I'm just keeping him on the table, hoping to wait him out to get a sit. Two more days. So getting him onto the table. And again, I can't pop him with the leash. I can't give him shaping pressure because everything is opposition reflex. I can't pull up on the leash. I can't lure with a toy because hashtag no guardrails, no impulse control. I can't really physically manipulate him in any way without full opposite uh, reaction. So I just have to wait. He lets go of the toy. He looks at me. He picks the toy up. He lets go of the toy, he looks at me, he picks the toy up. He lets go of the toy and finally he gets tired and he sits 
and that clicker hits and I present my second toy and he's allowed to jump down and take it. So on the 11th day, 11 days people, on the 11th day he learns sit. Good news. So now we go outside, change of venue. We don't want these behaviors to be limited to just this one room. I've got place tables identical to this one out on the open OB yard where you saw the video footage taken and saw the place table look just like the one that I used indoors. Take him outside, change a venue. Now we need to start repeating behaviors in a new venue. Show them that it's same game even though the, the, the scenery has changed. We get outside, I get the sit, I get the place, I get the out, I get it on leash. I get it off leash. <clears throat> now I start thinking, and I've even got the the recall, the hear command going a little bit. Uh, additionally, during this time, I get it down to a one toy game on a pinch collar and a 30 foot leash. I get him to where he will out on command and then I can call him here and get him to move five or six feet away from the toy and occasionally with the use of a, of a sturdy correction, I can stop him from reacquiring the first toy. So in this second phase outdoor, uh, outdoors, I've got sit, place, out, here, recall a little bit. And then we start working the stay and building this much impulse control where I can go over and collect the first toy and put it back into the pouch and then present it again and pay him and make it a one toy game, not a two toy game. Um, my, again, zero impulse control, no guardrails. My release command for him is okay. And I would have to pull that toy out. And if you wind up having to work with a dog like this, you must hold that toy stone statue still at first. Even if you're going to chuck it and get rid of it, release them from your obedience, the sit down or place with your release command without making a motion and then throw the toy. Because these dogs have no guardrail, if you pair this with any kind of a hand motion or a flick or a furtive movement, ahead of your release command. They have no impulse control, no guardrails. He's coming. And he's coming for that toy, maybe not in an aggressive handler eating, trainer eating way, but he's coming to get that toy and you're going to play hell keeping it away from him and putting him back in the box because he's never been told no. So pull it out, be absolutely stone still, give your release command and then flick it if you want to throw it and, and have him pursue and chase it. I've been even doing some where he just takes it from my hand near the thigh on his way by, but it's all on the release. Do not make any quick motion before the release. Now, I built on that impulse control by pulling out and presenting the award and switching hands and moving it around and releasing him both from the right hand and from the left hand. Don't set any patterns on him taking that toy because just like with your control sequence, once they figure out the events that lead up to him getting that toy, then they're going to call their own automatic go. It's, it's going to be an audible. They're going to tag themselves in and here they come. So you need to change the position of where you're holding that toy. I will come from the pouch, present it, hold it over here, hold it low next to the left thigh, switch hands, hold it low at the right thigh, then put it away. Again, we can't set the pattern or the expectation of just because it came out and you saw it, that means you're getting ready to come get it. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I changed my mind, but pull it out, move it around, build that patience and impulse control. The down. I hate to, to brag too much, but I'm going to brag a little. I've never trained a dog this way to down. So now we're at day 18 of working with this dog and I don't have a down. I have already taken the clicker off because I've proven that the dog knows the command, will wait for the reward 
everything is, is clear signal up to now and I've got everything running pretty well, then I realize I need a down. Well, he still doesn't have enough impulse control to lure him to the ground, certainly not with a toy. He doesn't have enough uh, food drive or, or um, inclination to take a treat to follow it to the ground. So I still don't have any play there. And he's still uh, a back tie dog that if he feels pressure equal and opposite, opposition reflex, I can't pull him to the ground. I can't shape him. I've got nothing there. I'll give you one thing about these dogs. They are high energy and have a ton of willingness to, to continue training. So what would on most dogs be an average 10, 15 minute obedience session? I can go 20 or 30 with this dog and he's still interested and, and still in the game. So I began to notice deep into these sessions, above 15 minutes, 20 perhaps, once I would reward him, he would run over and find a nice little out of the way spot and he would flop to the ground and let the toy go and lay there a second and then pick the toy back up. And I thought, light bulb, let me go back and I'm going to get the dog tired enough in training sessions to wear him down to where he consistently flops on the ground because I'm noticing over the course of the previous days, a consistent pattern. Once he's gassed, he would go over and find himself a spot and he would lay all the way down, elbows to the ground and flop down. And I thought, okay, be, he, he's doing it out of fatigue, but he's still throwing me the physical behavior I need. So I'm going to click it and mark it once he's fatigued and hopefully make inroads there. So if you've ever played the clicker game with people, where you have a human stand in for the dog and they step outside of the room and you're demonstrating how the clicker training works with other students and you tell them, okay, our dog's in the hallway, we're going to decide what the behavior is and we're going to use the clicker to teach the dog, the person, what we want them to do. We bring the person back in from outside the room and tell them, okay, do, do things, be active, and see if our new trainer can do a good job of showing you what behavior to do by hitting the clicker. I want the, the person to take their hat off and <clears throat> as their hands come toward the top of the body, our would-be trainer hits the clicker and eventually the person figures out, oh, I'm getting warm when I put my hands above shoulder level and they're up here. This has something to do with the task I'm supposed to perform. Eventually, we get them touching their head, we're hitting the clicker, and then finally, our person dog takes their hat off, and we click, 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 hey, and the whole room cheers. We taught our dog to take off the hat. So, how does that relate to this story? Dog number two would get fatigued, we play our game, we're doing the other behaviors, the clicker is now back out, I get him tired enough to lay down, he's got a toy in his mouth. The sequence of events, every time he would run to his, find a spot, he would let the toy go, fall to the ground in a down, and then immediately pick the toy back up. These things happen in such a quick sequence of events, even though I'm pretty slick with a clicker, the gap between him hitting the ground with his elbows and grabbing the toy that he had just let go was so close that I'm clicking it and I'm teaching him off, off legan, off, off legan. And I'm, I'm hitting that clicker and naming it under normal circumstances in the model of dog number one that took the treats really well. I am clicking the behavior and paying because he is luring and engaging in behaviors very willingly. And it's easy to click that behavior and then pay with that treat and then first you click and pay, then you name. Well, in this model, I don't have that luxury. I have to click it and name it for him to understand what we're doing. So I'm, I'm a little cart before the horse, but I knew that going into it. But the funny thing about that story is, and relating it to the person touching their hat rather than taking the ball cap off, that, that interval was so fast when I'm hitting that clicker and naming it, 
as I started to test the progress and I would say off, I would have him tired and he would run and build some distance between us and then he would turn and look at me and he would spit the toy out and I would say off and his elbows would bend just enough to pick the toy back up and we were that close where he thought when that marker would hit and he would self reward by picking that toy back up he thought off meant pick the toy back up so los meant let it go and he would do that and then off meant bend your elbows and pick it back up. Two days. <laughs> so we were hung up with just that tiny little bit of, of communication gap. But over the course of the next two days, we eventually got, oh, you want me to lay down. So at that two day mark where I started to get that first chip in the wall and I got a little daylight. Again, action items, I'm, I'm trying to tell you how to cope with this if you have to do it. So after I think that he's got a little bit of a clue, I bring him out onto the OB yard with no leash. And immediately, as you probably know, because you're a smart audience, what does he start doing? He starts throwing known behaviors that he wants to do. So he runs and jumps up on the place table and spins around and looks at me, waiting for me to, to mark and pay that. I don't because I don't want that. <coughs> so he jumps down off the place table. He walks out in the grass and he throws me a sit. Nothing happens. So I keep telling him off, off legan, off. And he walks around and he does everything a dozen times over except lay down. Then he starts getting pushy because again, no guardrails, no impulse control. He starts body checking me and trying to get close and starts trying to put his nose near the toy pouch. And I had to slap the crap out of him a little bit and set the boundaries that, no, you don't come up on me and you don't self-reward. And so then he's back into place and sit and I keep telling him off. And he finally, and it didn't even have to, I didn't care. He bent and was a couple of inches from the ground and he stopped, but I still hit the clicker and paid. And finally, it was, oh, you want me to lay down? And so I got the out, I got the stay, I picked up the one toy and put it away. And the intervals were five minutes apart, then three minutes apart, then two minutes apart. And then we started to get some progress. The down really started to come, hit the clicker, pay, one toy game. Let him run around, get the out, get the sit, get the stay, pick it back up, get the down, and then pay again. And so at this point, we're at about 22 days, 22 days of work to teach an Eastern Block back tie dog basic obedience that didn't get done at the vendor in the basic course, by the way. Cough. Um, anyhow, 22 days into it. I got a good good uh, amount of behaviors going. Clicker goes away again. I do another three days of just starting to introduce obstacles on the O course, running through our known behaviors, and then start to introduce the e-collar and put him back on limiting uh, factors like your leash where I can get him back on the table, teach him how to control the stem with known behaviors and, and mark and pay things that he knows how to do. Um, his detection's okay. Obviously, again, no, no surprise here. His bite is ferocious and insane and energetic. And he'll hit the suit. Um, doesn't care about body parts. You don't have to teach him the back or the chest. The thing that is oriented towards that dog on approach that he can get the easiest, the fastest he's going to take. So anything that you want to test on the dog is just a matter of you showing some decoymanship and either throwing the item out there in front of him that he wants. And again, he's a back tie dog. All he needs is something in front of his mouth and he's going to grab it and hold it as if his life depends on it. So all of the bites that, that uh, he's displayed in the suit so far, 
It doesn't matter. He doesn't care. It's If it's close enough to grab, he's going to grab it. Um, so no surprise there. That's consistent with patrol dog number one. Um, I guess, you know, there, there's the silver lining. Woo! You know, he'll take anything. He's not body part specific. He's not equipment specific. He's not balking uh, on the suit because you don't have a hard barrel sleeve. He's not barking or balking on taking a leg because you're, you're, um, he's an arm oriented dog. So yeah, that, that's not there. Still doesn't know how to walk on a leash. I'm trying to do IED route clear training with him and having a dog that wants to go behind you on a 30 foot line, which on IEDs, unless it's consistent with the wind and you've set up a training aid that he's gone past and the, the odor is now consistent with the wind and he's going back behind you because he's picked it up. You cannot teach a dog or allow the muscle memory of them doing these orbits around you on a 30 foot leash and certainly not on a route clear. They need to stay out in front of you uh, the entire time unless you direct them behind you for some reason. But everything else is an absolute pain in the ass and a nightmare. And I'll close with this. So why are we seeing these dogs? Well, part of the problem are police departments. Even my own department 25 years ago was very, very reluctant to take this KNPV PH2, by the way, not PH1, but PH2 and OBJ certified the objector Wugan. I, I'm not Dutch, so I'm sure I butchered that, but I don't care. If you know, you know. So he's got PH1, PH2, and OBJ which is very rare even 25 years ago for that dog to be exported with his actual certificates and not just the score sheets, um, which I got both, by the way, with that dog, which was a, a huge boon, very neat uh, keepsake all these years later. But with that being said, um, this dog, uh, golly, I lost, where was I going with the whole very thing in, in the title. I was right there with it. Man, that might be a first where I really lost the, the handle on what I was discussing. Ah! Got it back. I got it back. The police department. <clears throat> so even though as, as odd as it was that this dog was exported and such a blessing and, and a net benefit to us, the department, I don't know, it's four years old, it's a lot of money, how long are we going to get to work it, how many years do we get out of this dog, uh, when, as a general rule, in, in all of the special operations dog programs through the GWAT, me in particular, I, I didn't give a crap about a dog being four or five years old. If they really had what it took in the assessment and screening process, and I knew that I could train this dog and he was going to be shit hot. It's the GWAT. This dog may get off a, an aircraft or a, a land vehicle and may work five minutes and get blown up or shot to pieces. If the dog had what it took and I knew that I could get this dog trained to the standard we needed to deploy on a short timeline, man, if we got two years, three years out of that dog, that was high cotton. Um, and not even mortality, but just uh, uh, psychological attrition. Dogs getting blown up, being in vehicles that hit IEDs, no longer being suitable to work, um, having psychological trauma from, from the stressors of deployment and not being stable around gunfire anymore, things of this nature. So we were so apt to be able to lose a dog so quickly, I wasn't looking for a dog that was 16 months, 18 months old that I could work for the next 10 years, but police departments were and still are. So police departments have been one of the big market drivers in the young, 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 give me a young dog that, you know, the department's going to budget for to buy one time and then try to get 10 years of service out of this dog. And, and life cycle it and adopt it out and get a new one 10 years later and put that money back in the budget. So police departments have been the number one guilty party in the pressure to make dogs younger and younger in the marketplace because they're buying them. 
uh, supply and demand. If, if, if there's a demand for it and the young dogs are in the marketplace and police departments are going to pick them up, then vendors are going to say, okay, you want them young, here they come young. Um, wow. <laughs> that did not sound right. Anyway, I'm going to just cruise on by. So anyway, that being said, the, the market forces start looking for younger and younger dogs. So some of these trainers say, well, why should I spend all of the time to take the dog all the way to the regionals or the nationals and only get a little bit more out of them uh, on the back end? I can go ahead and cut these dogs loose and put them in the market much younger. Then you get the back tie kennels who say, you know what? I can beat their price because at 8, 10, 12 months old, this dog's going to sell. We're going to put the minimal amount of man hours into it. It's going to be crazy and high energy and high drive. And here's going to be your dog. And it's going to be a $6,000 dog in, in Eastern Bloc country, which is pretty crazy cheap. And vendors who have contracts like the one I'm beholden to stateside, they say, wow, I'm getting how much for uh, a basic course slot and a dog that's allegedly pre-trained um wow i can really maximize my overhead by not buying a title dog and only buying a, a dog that's 10 months old and costs six thousand dollars and only showing you the dogs uh that are young and and back tie kennel production dogs so there's one more component a friend of mine that has houston canine academy in uh, houston my previous Second to, to this video, um, the canine seminar recap from Dothan, Alabama and training scars. Um, we were down there for the week together training, had a great time. We had a good talk uh, about the market and he says, hey, a lot of these old heads that, that we know that were top of their game, KNPV trainers, Schutzen trainers over in, the, in Western Europe, they're aging out. And we're we're not raging out aging out i didn't say raging the first time i just want to make sure you heard me correctly uh they they're just getting older and they're slowing down on doing uh club certs and and working dog certs their their uh sport certs their kids aren't interested in it it's it's pretty sad um same thing we're looking at in the United States where kids don't want to follow in their parents' footsteps. They're more into the internet and electronic diversions and, and have other interests. And they're not just, uh, they're, they just don't care to go out and put the work in. Uh, mom and dad or my uncle or, or grandma and grandpa, whoever, they're old fuddy duddies and they go out and play with dogs with all of their old friends at the club on the weekend and I don't want to go. And so, the word that I'm getting from him, as well as uh, Mike Reaver, that I had an opportunity to speak with back in December, they just aren't uh, available in the numbers uh, that they used to be. And a big function of that is the market forces in the U.S. don't demand it anymore. They don't demand a two or three year old title dog. In many cases, they don't want that. And the production side of that in Western Europe. The kids just aren't interested anymore, and that's that's a real shame. Hopefully, the the tradition can stay alive. I'm sure it will to some degree, uh, but the the market and the talent pool and the knowledge base in Europe for sport dogs is on the decline, and that's pretty sad. So I'll close it right there. Holy crap. I know that's another long one. Some, some of my friends in my inner circle like that. Some don't. But anyway, there we are full circle. What's an Eastern Block import dog? What are the characteristics of that? What are the training challenges of that? And why do we, why do we see them now in the marketplace? Hope you enjoyed it. If you, if you stuck it out this long, you're a hardcore fan and I appreciate it. Um, hit me up. Maybe. We'll, we'll take this thing out and go fishing. I might shoot an Instagram video and show you how loud and redneck AF this boat is, but I like it. <laughs> Thanks for joining. 
We'll see you on the next one. Check out p2tk9.com for equipment. Appreciate it.